This Twin Peaks Investing Podcast is brought to you in association with SharePad from ShareScope, the UK's number one investment data and analysis software for private investors and traders. Visit sharescope.co.uk and discover the advantage. Hello and welcome to the Twin Peaks Investing Podcast. My name is Peter Higgins and you can find me at Conquest 3 on Twitter. And I'm here with Wheelie Pete at Wheelie Dealer on Twitter. Now, today's date is the 22nd of the 3rd of March and it's currently quarter past six. Um, welcome back. Thank you for joining us again, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you for subscribing to um, um to YouTube and thank you for those of you that have also supported the Memphis charity. We'll talk about that a bit later on. Um, we're going to go straight into the markets um, because so much has has, has happened. Um, but first, let's say hello to Pete, who has joined us again. I actually was more or less on time for Pete today, so we're gonna, we made a good start. We're not starting at quarter past seven; it's actually quarter past six. So, Pete, you've been tracking the markets. What yeah. do you make of it? Have you got any? Have you got any more hair than you had last week? Last po- podcast. Well, I shaved, so uh, no, no. Um, it's been uh, an interesting couple of weeks. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously, we've had the markets falling away, which is exactly what we were expecting, and we talked about on podcast TPA TPI ninety six. It fell away as we expected. Um, we had all the concerns around the banks and stuff. It seems like, fingers crossed, things appear to have sort of bottomed out. Um, Probably last Monday, I think it was. This is Wednesday today. Um, And since that, we've had, what was it, Friday? So we've had a bit of a bounce since that. And, you know, it's looking in reasonable shape for that bounce to continue. Um, I think the... um, bailout of effective bailout of Credit Suisse, the dealing with the banks, uh, SVB, Silicon Valley Bank in the US and the subsidiary in the UK, the latter getting bought by HSBC, and some um, more liquidity pumped into the system by the central federal banks, the central banks, etc. That all seems to calm things down. So yeah, I, I think things are looking better. Personally, I'm quite pleased, fingers crossed, with how it's gone, because I made some money on a short going down, although I did close that a bit early, but it's easy to say that with hindsight. Um, And I've managed to go long again for the bounce, and I bought some shares in on the beach yesterday, so I've been nibbling as well. So, you know, I'm reasonably pleased with how I've, performed during the panic and I've been very good at not getting too much into the detail and the worry and the fear and the terror of it all Um, and I think that's really helped me you know I'm just focusing on the charts focusing very much on the high level news and just not getting bogged down in the detail and fueling my own imagination which makes makes me then fear things more you know so I think that really helps. Yeah, I think when the conversation I was having in the last podcast was one of my worries was the fact that the the Dow Jones had, had tipped below thirty three thousand, and I didn't imagine what was going to happen. At, you know, shortly after that podcast, that we were going to be talking that weekend, which was around the eleventh, I think the weekend was for um, about Silicon Valley Bank um, causing all the problems that it did, and the markets were starting to to fall that week prior to the weekend and then subsequently um, when the markets opened um last week um the the markets just carried on getting hammered and hammered and hammered and i think at one point the the dow jones went below 32 um and very low 31s um and then we were quite worried because there was no more noise about what was going on with silicon valley and obviously they then came out and um, HSBC got the UK arm for a pound. Um, the rest of it more or less got sorted out betwixt all the other banks in a in a, in, a, in America. Um, and then it went, didn't it? Silicon Valley just 
has, has gone kaput. Um, so it's interesting how they've all dealt with it. And then when we thought, oh, you know what, that's over with, everyone was starting looking at all the other regional banks in the US. Some of them last week were down 50, 60, 70%. And you're like, wow, that's some significant movement there. And so there was a domino effect and a risk factor going on. I think the, the most interesting part of all of this was um, I think at the very beginning of it, I put out a, a video of an avalanche and how fast it moves and somebody getting, you know, the person survived, but was un saw the avalanche coming, was filming it, and then it went, oh, and then, you know, <laughs> got themselves to a place of safety and, and survived the avalanche. But, you know, when a, when an avalanche is, is traveling at that sort of speed, no one really knows what the outcome is going to be, how fast it's going to spread. And this is what's happened with this implosion of... Um, Silicon Valley Bank and the domino effect and all the other banks and the larger banks also saw their share prices in America, uh, Bank of America and the others, all their share price got hit the week before last. And then Friday, we started worrying about Credit Suisse. Um, and that was like, uh oh, you know, all of the conversation over the weekend was this is a worry. This is a worry. This is not this is not great. And then I think it was Sunday night. There was conversations had this Sunday just gone. And I thought what we call a forced arranged marriage. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, the share price had finished at $2.01 um, on the Friday. Um, UBS, another Swiss bank, was basically being, I think behind the scenes were being told, we need to address this, you know, you need to buy it. <laughs> you know, you don't you have know, a choice. You, yeah. you, you really deal, I have to, has to marry, you know, Mrs. Piggy over <laughs> here. Um or you Kermit the Frog has to marry, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it was like, wow. And so UBS goes, okay, it's $2 a share, $2 and one cent a share. Um, and the equivalent of there or thereabouts of 8 billion of value. We'll buy it for 1 billion. We'll offer 27 cents. And you're going, what? They, they'll, they'll never get away with that. That possible, that cannot possibly happen. Um, and of course they couldn't, they wouldn't allow that to happen. Um, so negotiations are had, and you really dealer being, um, you know, being the forced person to take accept this marriage, <laughs> have come back and go, okay, I'll marry Credit Suisse for fifty four cents in, or for fifty four cents, just over two billion, and the Swiss government go, okay, <laughs> and and I'm sitting there at the weekend going, what what's just happened, what's yeah. going on, there is something not right here. If a company is worth eight billion and suddenly gets sold for the equivalent of two billion, what are they hiding? What secrets are being kept behind closed doors? Why 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 don't we know what the truth is behind this? And for me, Pete, you're an analytical guy. I'm an analytical guy. We're doing research, we've got all these fundamentals, we're crunching all these numbers. Yes, I know you believe in your charts and you trust your charts, but fundamentals are what give us value. We yeah. put our well, money on the numbers here say this, this, and this. The numbers here say that's what the return should be. Mm. That we talk about return on invested capital the other time, yeah? Re return on capital employed the other time, and yeah. so on and so on and so forth. We talk about PE all the time, we talk about dividend, we talk about dividend cover. Those are the numbers that we build our portfolios on. Oh yeah, right? yeah. So if yeah. you can't trust the bank to be worth 8 billion on a Friday and get sold, we talk about take unders a lot here because it usually happened <laughs> oh, to me. Yeah. Um, You've got two dollars a share, and it's come all the way down from thirty odd down to two. You're sitting there going, "At least when we get taken over by UBS, we'll probably get two and a half, maybe get three if we're lucky." To be taken out for fifty four cents, I was I was like, "No." So I started trimming some stuff on Friday because I was like, "There's something not quite right here. Other things are going to happen." Trim some yeah. more on Tuesday. Bought some. Then you know, look at the markets again, and because I've got all this cash, I'm looking, thinking, "Hmm, that looks interesting." So I bought some stuff on Tuesday and I bought some stuff today. Yeah. Um, but hey, I just don't, I've lost trust in the market. I've lost trust in my own awareness of what's really going on. Because I think I read a lot. I think I read the papers a lot. I think I look at really deep, deep e economical, e economic guys and ladies that do deep research and I read a load of blogs. And I think I'm, I've got a level of understanding of what something should be worth. Yeah, I'm a big book there, the Securities Analysis book. This one, yeah, here. yeah, pour over it almost every single day to see what I've missed and what other. And I might as well have put that on a bonfire when it comes to Credit Suisse. I was like, well, that's a load of nonsense, then. Yeah, 
you know, I, I mean, and, and then on top of that, Pete, you had the AT, AT1 cocoa bonds, right? Imploded, eight billion pounds worth of that. And I've now read upon that, and they had a tiny little print here to say, mm, if there's a case of a default, and if there's a case of that, you will not get paid. But Pete, that's 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 down here in the small print where you need you know you need your your, your yeah. Yeah. to actually see that sort of print. But how many companies and institutions are now sitting there at eight billion loss, impacted oh. by the not reading the fine print of those cocoa bonds? And people say, oh, they're going to get sued. They're going to get they might well get sued. But I think if the if that small print on the cocoa bonds is legit, AT1 bonds is legit, those people haven't got a leg to stand on. You know, it's really interesting because I think that was the thing that stood out to me as most shocking in a way. The fact that when any company is effectively insolvent or bankrupt, whatever, the idea is that bondholders are high enough, higher up the pecking order to get any yep. if there is some value in the company when an administrator sells it or whatever the bondholders are higher up in the peck in order to at least get something than equity holders who are pretty much always wiped out. So I thought it was incredible that, that effectively equity holders actually got some money, but a load of a class of bondholders were pretty much wiped out, which is like that, that really was surprising. As you say, the cocoa bonds. Um, but it's funny because it comes back to this thing. I think there's several points around this. Um, Henry, Viola raised this issue on Twitter. He he said, you know, when you see Credit Smith, Credit Swiss is worth whatever one minute, and then it's worth next to nothing. Um, how can we trust balance sheets and stuff? I think we need to um, before we get you know throw away all our securities analysis books and valuation books. I think we need to consider that banks are sort of a bit different when it comes to balance sheets and stuff. I think for a normal company, we can still trust our analysis to an extent, but I think banks, their balance sheets are very strange beasties. I mean, one of the things that has caused all this crisis, particularly with Silicon Valley Bank, is this idea that you can have a load of bonds with your, on your balance sheet, at, if you're SVB, on your balance sheet, you can have a load of bonds that are mark to market, yeah? So that means as the value of them fluctuates every day, the value of the bonds on your balance sheet fluctuates every day. And you can decide to let that chunk be mark to market. Then you can have another chunk which you decide is somehow different and you're keeping that forever. And because you're keeping it forever, its value doesn't fluctuate on your balance sheet, even though in reality, the bond's value is fluctuating every day. So, so there's yeah. all these sort of anomalies that just make it completely nonsensical. So, you know, I think, yeah, that that's that's one of the issues. I think the other thing, and it comes back to what I was saying about deliberately trying not to get too into the crisis and worrying myself, because I, I know what happens is my imagination runs away with itself, yeah? I start mm -hmm. reading about all these problems. It just makes me more and more scared. And if I'm scared, I'm not going to do the right thing. So what I was focusing on apart from just listening to the high level news and keeping abreast of what was happening, I pretty much assumed on, you know, Friday night, Saturday, that a deal was going to be done for Credit Suisse at the end of play Sunday. I don't hold Credit Suisse. I don't hold UBS. I wasn't particularly bothered how that played out as long as a deal was done. And it was pretty obvious a deal was going to be done because if they didn't, you'd have absolute chaos on Monday morning. So all I was really looking at was those RSI, Relative Strength Index, readings on the charts. And on Friday night, the FTSE 100 was on an RSI of 20 or something like that. That is an extreme oversold position. I pointed out on Twitter that over the last 15 years, 
it had only been lower than that once, and that was in the pandemic. And you know, you sort of when you when you just look at things in that way, try to not feed the fear, try to be objective. It really changes how you do things, and it really helped me a lot. That's a good. That's a good way of, of looking at it, Pete. I mean, the the thing the thing for me, and I was I, know, I was talking to Henry via via DMs about the 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 Swiss thing and trying to to to, to 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 impart on him and share with him some of the rationale behind some of what was going on, which I'd just about got my head round, <laughs> you know, on on Monday and Tuesday. So yeah, so it's good to have those sort of conversations with the people that are, are actually going scratching the head, going, "What's going on?" I think. The, the the interesting thing prior to um to the credit suisse issue was going back and looking and you touched on a little bit of there was that silicon valley bank were having so much in deposits they didn't know what to do with they then put them into certain bonds but because interest rates started to go up they actually commenced 2023 with certain level of bonds unedged unedged yeah. you talk about edging all the time and one of the banks with I don't know, whatever billions in assets were on edge to Pete. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. the point. And during the last... that, sorry, can I just say that is the point that that chunk of bonds on the balance sheet that is marked to market needs to be hedged. And the fact they didn't hedge it. Yeah. Ex 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 exactly. And during the last quarter, they had so much withdrawals as well because people were getting, you know, getting a bit concerned about it over the last quarters. Some of the big money people were telling their people to get money out before we even knew who Silicon Valley Bank was in the UK. Yeah. Right? yeah. Um, and then it got taken over. But really interesting point, I put a tweet out about this as well, was about the um, the, the, Swiss, the Swiss Bank, right? Mm. So you had Credit Suisse. And basically, I think it goes back to 20. Sorry, 2002 to 2022. And there's been, a, I can't remember all the names of the different issues and problems, but this is a bank that were fined more than 11.7 billion in fines over those 22 years, right? There's a book that that's, I haven't got on mate, this pile here that's called more than, um, The that's Signs more than Were Boris There by the Tim Steers. Say again? That's more than Boris got fined on the parties. <laughs> We won't even go with that one, mate. Wow. Sorry. That is but there is a very, very there is a very good book uh, by a chap called Tim Steers, um, Steer, sorry, who is yeah. a former fund manager, uh, Artemis, I think he was with, and the book is called The Signs Were There. Right? It's not dissimilar to where are we are, the Smart Money Method, which looks at the forensic side of um of um accounting and looking at what's going on underneath the balance sheet. Um, and it, it was there for all to see. There's a problem within this company. And I think going back to the conversation I was having with you about it being taken over for 54 cents or there or thereabouts from a two pound per two dollars per share um share price yeah tells you and the bit that the fear that hit me was there's something seriously wrong here in this bank. What other banks are carrying this same sort of problem? How have they gotten away with getting this? I say, I, I love a bargain. I'm always looking for bargains. If I can do the crunch my numbers using the security analysis book and find two pounds, two dollars worth of assets and get away with buying it for 54 cents, I will buy it all day. Mm. You know what I mean? If it's not a bank, I'll buy it all day. And I'll wait for the market to come back and say, yeah, we'll we'll take that out for two dollars, Pete. I'll wait all day. But if it's two pounds a, a, a share right now, yeah, I'm going to wait for it to fall to 54 I'm not going to try and buy it for 54. <laughs> Are you with me? Oh, yeah. UBS yeah. have gotten away with it. So that tells me there's other stuff within Credit Suisse, which is which hasn't been told to us. There's something mm. wrong in the cupboard. That cupboard's full of skeletons, Pete. So, you know, I've yeah, been watching think... the UBS share price going forward. That's what I'll, I'll be doing. And the other thing was we touched on the, uh, the money market funds a little bit as well. During the um, past, I think it was last July, July 2022, the Fed started raising interest rates, right? Yeah. And there's a chart that I've put out about it as well. And essentially, you look at bank deposits across the US, and they just, about a month after that, they peaked, and they've been drifting down ever, ever since, deposits in the US banks. People have been taking those out because interest rates are going up. They're getting better on their savings and putting their money into money market funds. And yesterday, there was a, a, a piece of research I saw which said that money market funds had swelled to 5.4 trillion 
right? Wow. So that's 5.4 trillion from where it was um, last July, which was about 4.25, I think it was. So essentially, let's just say 1 trillion for a round number yeah, yeah, has yeah. gone out of US bank deposits. Wow. So that's a lot of dough on your balance sheet that's gone elsewhere. Yeah, so you're totally. then trying to fight that. So, wow. yeah, it's a mess. My concern is now which bank is next. Yeah. yeah. My money's on Deutsche My money's on Deutsche Bank in the in Europe. And I'd be very concerned about the Bank Bank of America as well. The bank ticker symbol B A B A C. I'd be very worried about them as well. Is it over? This bank is flux over with. My thought is no. Um, I'll carry on watching the market. I'll carry on trimming stuff. Carry on selling some stuff. Um, the numbers you touched on, on about the candlesticks and all the other metrics, Pete. Mm. On Friday, the markets, FTSE 100s closed at 7,335, which is the number that I've been watching, right? Yeah. And the intraday high of of, um, of Monday yeah. was 7,426, yeah. right? So higher than Fridays. The low of that day, because everyone's like, <gasps> took a shouting intake of breath after the seven UBS. 7,206. Seven seven wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I've been watching the high. Uh, I mean, obviously, they closed at 7,403. We had the, we were like wallop down 130 odd points, right? In the morning, in the first couple of hours. And then slowly but surely, the markets rallied a little bit, yeah. rallied some more. And we closed nearer the highs on Monday at 7,403. More good news, more momentum. Everyone's taking the, taking a pause for breath. They're sorting stuff out in America. The credit suite situation is, is sort of like, mm, everyone's thinking, right, okay, well, is that it over with now? Um, so we went from um, a closing on Monday night at um, FTSE 100 at 7,403. Uh, we had a intraday high of um, 7,557. I mean, it closed at 7,536. So again, we went up again, went up 132 points on Tuesday. Now, this is quite interesting, Pete. Now, bearing in mind, right, that the intraday high on Tuesday was 7,557, right? Yeah. Today, we've hit another intraday high, Yeah. right? So that's three on the bounce we've had. All right. So that might give the technicals, technical analysis people out there and people that like the charts, such as yourself, a bit of a because we hit 7,585 today and we finished again above where we finished on Tuesday at 7,586. And little old friendless FTSE AIM all share closed back above um, 804 today, having touched a low on Monday of 793 and it closed on friday at 804 and today it's closed at 804 again so if that's the weakest link in our indices aim is showing that even it has put its head back back above the water but above the water and uh and can breathe a bit of air well so you know what? that's potentially a little bit of positive news i mean obviously we're going to touch about the inflation bit and what the data we had today which yeah. didn't help matters i think if we'd not had that data today we would have gone above um, seven thousand six hundred. Yeah, no, I think there's there's something I've noticed distinctly in the last couple of days that we didn't see last week, and that was if the market started to rise last week, it would then sell off intraday, and we'd end up down or whatever. Yeah, that changed on Monday because we had that big flush out where it went down to 7.2 seven nearly on the FTSE 100. Mm. Then we got the lovely reversal, which was my signal to say, look, we've got a crazy low RSI. We've had a reversal candlestick on going long, and, and fingers crossed that's worked out pretty well. Um, but I've noticed the difference in the last couple of days. So this is Wednesday and obviously yesterday, Tuesday. Um, what has happened today is... Every time the market goes down, it comes back up again. Every time it goes up, it keeps going up. And that's a real change of, of tone in the market that you can really, you can notice it quite easily and you can feel it quite easily. So that's a really mm -hmm. great thing. Something else that I've noticed on the technicals, which is I've actually found quite fascinating, and that is that 
before we had this sell off, you know, in the last couple of weeks, um, the NASDAQ, NASDAQ composite, and obviously the NASDAQ 100, because they're very similar, um, was showing quite a bit of positivity and looking pretty good, yeah? And the mm. irony is we had the big problem with SVB, which was very much a bank that lent to um, smaller tech stocks, and it did lend to some big tech stocks. Incredible thing is, despite all that, the NASDAQ, to me, is the best-looking index still. And whereas last night it was quite incredible because all the, you know, like FTSE 100, the Dow, the S&P, they were all on an RSI reading pretty much below RSI 50 or slightly above 50. Mm. The NASDAQ mm. was well above 50. It was like an RSI 60 or something or whatever. And it was so relative strength, it was so much stronger than the other indexes. So even though it was in a way a tech sector and banking sector problem, the NASDAQ has actually shaken this off pretty well. And I think we'll see that in the S&P 500 pretty soon as well. Yeah, you're right. It's been very strong. I mean, one of the winners prior to um, to this week's um, traffic, um, negative traffic on the markets, you remember the ARK ETF with Ka with Kathy? Yeah, Kathy Woods, yeah, yeah. Kathy Woods and everyone was knocking it. Oh. I think at one stage that was up nearly 15, 20% year to date. Um, obviously, it's given up some of that. Um, but the bizarre thing is, and we we do mock it and we we knock it and we all the rest of it. But you know who the, the biggest winners are out of this current de demise of the, the markets over the past two weeks, Pete? Do you know who have who've been most successful as investors? Well, I'd imagine a lot of fund managers have been using the opportunity to buy No, 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 no. A, a oh, crypto. A, a, crypto. An, asset, an asset class, which you crypto. and I go, we're not going yeah. there. Do you know what the asset class is? Crypto and gold. Crypto and gold. Bitcoin yeah. has absolutely, year to date, smashed everybody else. And the one that's meant to be the safest place to hide, um, which all the, the larger investors go to, they put 100 grand in there, they put 50 grand in there, 250 grand in there. Bonds. Bonds have been oh. battered yeah. so, so far, year to date. Uh, investors in bonds are scratching their head going, every single metric that I used to, used to use to measure and, vol and value, blah, 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 regarding bonds, have been battered. Because all the rule book, all the stuff that makes sense to them and made sense to me, what looked like new bonds, have been t thrown upside down in the air, you know. And it just, it just, it just beggars belief when there's rules to be applied for everybody else, Pete. You mean everybody else, mm. and then governments, you know, including our own, just go, nah, we're going to rewrite it over the weekend. It's amazing what can be done when it, when it, when they want it to happen. When they How have quickly to. things yeah. can change. On yeah. the course of a weekend, you yeah. might not be able to get a doctor's appointment, mate, for three years. But if they want to change the whole financial system over a weekend, by golly, they will. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? <laughs> you know, I had friends that I was speaking to last weekend, um, the week before last, going, you know, and we're talking to some CEOs and CFOs that have got um, businesses and startups and entrepreneurs that have got money in the banks and all the rest of it. And Pete, the amount of distress I was dealing with and people I was trying to support was staggering you know and i might not the government and governments you know but the fact that they actually spent the weekend the weekend before last and saved the uk arm of um Sil Sil silicon valley bank and ensured that all those deposits all those wages all those salaries all the monies that those startups and entrepreneurs had in that bank oh yeah were safeguarded was were absolutely immense mm. i'd spent the weekend before last at a party a friend's 50th and there's a chap there I know quite well from from um, from Memphis, and he's called Callum McKeefery. Sold his business. He's moving on to um, he's part of this larger group now, and they're going to do great things. We're having this conversation. We're talking about Memphis and charities and stuff we're going to do together going forward. And obviously, he's not going to tell me everything, um, but you know, told me a fair bit of stuff about what's going on with his his monies and 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 so on and so forth. Didn't mention he had, obviously wasn't any need to be talking about Silicon Valley Bank. Yeah, yeah. Next thing I know. Callum has got 50 million pounds in Silicon Valley Bank. Good Lord. Yeah, part of the business that he'd sold, right? Wow. And I'm like, my 
right? So I'm doing my tweets. I'm putting stuff out there. I send them to this lady that works for, for Telegraph, um, and they have a lot of chat, and there's a big spread on. I've put it out there, a big spread on him with this lady with the Telegraph. But essentially, because of the government's intervention, Pete, and this is the thing what people don't understand, if that bank had gone, 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 oh, right, yeah. Yeah. you are covered for £85,000. Yeah. Right? £50 million, pounds and they go, yeah, Pete, here's 85. <laughs> here's, here's 85K. Yeah. 50 million. Yeah. Luckily, they sorted it out. They got the HSBC walloped in there. Have that for a pound. Take it all out. Safeguarded all the deposits. He's got his money now. What advice do you give to people that have got loads of money in one bank? Spread it out as much as you can. Is there enough banks to put 50 million in so you're covered for 85 grand in each of them? I don't know. I don't know the answer no, to that. But yeah. boy, oh boy, he came in with a whisker, Pete. A whisker a of 50. working for the last 40, well, not 40 years, he's not that old, 25-ish um, well, years. It's life, yeah. Building yeah, a company, yeah. losing a company, building a company, building another one, growing yeah. the company, getting it taken over, and then... It may have might it was might have been zeroed. Do you know so what the government is... absolutely came on and did for and there's thousands of people's jobs here at Pete, by the way. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. When they saved Silicon Valley Bank from going under regarding the UK arm, they safeguarded so many jobs, so many entrepreneurs, um, businesses and so on and so forth. And the ecosystem of the UK, they smashed it. They really, really did. I guess I guess one positive about having Rishi Sunak as the PM, is that he very much understands finance after what he's been doing all his career. And that probably helped. He understood yeah, he's, the he's magnitude got, got a, of the problem. Yeah, he's also, Pete, no one really talks about this as well. He's, he's got a tech background as well. He's got an interest in tech. So he yeah, understands that community. That. Yeah. And they were battering his door down a week ago last on Sunday. They were battering his door down, mate. You've got to sort something out. There were basically people in rooms all day and night, just do, 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 do. and they did it. They sorted yeah. it out. So yeah. I can't praise them enough because no, I wouldn't have wanted to see Callum when he's had. A, he's got a newborn. He's got a newborn. Oh. About, what uh, three or four months old? I wouldn't want to see him. You know, uh, Pete, have you got anywhere to lodge uh, until I sort myself out? You know, Imagine from... that you, it just doesn't yeah, bear anything about. It's awful. This is a quick hello to you, our valued Twin Peaks Investing Podcast listener. Whatever channel you're listening to, please make sure to subscribe and you'll always be the first to get the new episodes. Thank you for your continued support. Funny enough, it makes me, I mean, I hold HSBC, HSBA, yeah. and I hold Stan, um, Standard mm -hmm. Chartered, and I sort of haven't been overly happy with those positions and i've been thinking of actually you know moving them moving them on at some stage mainly because the whole sort of china aspect gets on my my, my boobies a bit you know so i thought well you know but but then with this problem that's come up it's made me think even more do i actually want exposure to banks I mean, it's bad enough having exposure to insurance companies and whatever, which are in the final financial sector. But then I sort of think, well, I, I don't think I even want to ever have a bank again. So I can see myself selling HSBA and Stan at some point fairly soon just to get that problem off my books. You know what I mean? I just don't want them. They're just, they're just more trouble than they're worth. Yeah, well, I've had I've had several conversations with people on Twitter, and I was asked, you know, uh, when I mentioned I bought another stock on Twitter, and someone said, "Is it a bank?" And I said, "Look, I've spoken to so many people that worked in the industry, so many investment bankers, and the one recurring thing that comes back from most of them when I ask them, they don't invest in the banking sector. You know, there's a, there's a reason why. You know, yeah. they worked in it, and when they said, well, you put your money in it,' they go, "No, that's just one to avoid for me." Um, I I do prefer the insurance sector, Pete. I have got my eye on a stock. Um, um, I've not had much luck with um, DLG. I already own um, Legal in General from ages ago, so I've been collecting dividends from that. That's yeah. dropped back a bit. I've seen lots of people talking about it over the past week or so because it's back in, in deep value territory. So it's paying a significant dividend yield. It's a solid company. Um, it's now in a good price. Mm -hmm. um, will I add to it? I'm not quite sure yet because, like I say, I'm still jittery about the market. So um, I'm not sure I want to add to that just yet. But I have got my eye on another um, stock in the insurance sector. 
And on Monday, when the markets were wobbling, the price that I had earmarked to buy it at, I was asleep at the wheel because I was I was doing my panicking bit. I wasn't as calm as I should have been. The uh, price yeah. came into my zone. Honestly, this is the truth, Pete. Yeah. The price came into my buy zone. See, it's what, it's I went, the problem I have all the time. Yeah, yeah. I find I, that, because, that I get be, myself really scared. Yeah, but it wasn't it that I got myself really scared. It was because I'd lost, I'd lost trust in yeah. the market because of the UBS yeah. Great Sweets marriage. And I was like, the price is there now. You can go and buy it and forget about it for the three, four, five years. Mm. And you're going to get a, a, div- a nice chunky dividend over the next three, four, five years. And I was like, no, I'm leaving it. What's happened since? I think the share price has gone up 15% since then. And that's how fast it's moved. And it's a wow. blue chip company yeah. as well. And I was like, mm, okay, fair enough. I've missed it. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm cool with it. But it's one of them where had I not, not lost trust in the market and financials, which essentially, like you say, um, an insurance company is, I would have been buying it, mate, at 15% lower than it is today. Yeah. And that would have been on Monday. Two days made 15% on yeah. a chunk of change. Incredible. And then been able to get a dividend, you know, in a little while from it as well. 20% within a heartbeat, missed it. All because of the Credit Suisse marriage. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's it is what it is, Pete. It's it's about learning. And I think what we've seen, and you saw it on Monday when we hit that FTSE, FTSE 7206, institutions were panicking, Pete. They were selling because they don't move yeah, that fast they will. on retail sales. Yeah, they will. Yeah. The thing uh, is, yeah. you've got to remember institutions, fund managers, whatever, they are all humans. You know, they have the same yeah. emotions we do. They they can yeah. just as easily get carried away by it all as we can. It, it, it's really interesting because I've had this thing for some time now, for a few years, where I've been deliberately trying to unlearn everything I know and to make <laughs> to make my system more simple. And it's something that I've picked up from how Naked Trader Robbie Burns does stuff, yeah? He is so simple with his process. And I think I think I do and I think a lot of other investors overcomplicate things. And it's it comes back to this it's like paralysis by analysis. We spend so much time looking into things and analyzing things and whatever, and we're missing the goddamn obvious thing that's staring us in the face. So, you know, that's something I've been really working on and trying to simplify how I do things. And I and I feel like I'm sort of getting there, but it's 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 obviously not easy. Um, mate, I wanted to say there was another couple of things that that come up. Um with the bank balance sheets, one thing that doesn't tend to show on those, it may be buried very, 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 very deep in the account, is the counterparty risk. And, and in a way, that's like an off-balance sheet thing that you can't really quantify. But the problem is, if, if counterparties, so if they've got swap agreements or whatever, if those things go belly up, then the bank has a problem, you know? So there's a lot of those kind of things going on. And of course, you've got the, the classic problem with a bank that, that, that is inherent in a fractional reserve banking system. So, so we have a banking system where effectively, if, if you're the bank, Mr. Conkers 3, and I, lend, and I lend you a pound, you will lend that pound out 10 times to 10 other people. So you have created nine pounds from one pound. And what what actually the bank relies on is confidence. They are they they work on the theory that I won't want that pound back for some time. So that means they can lend out, and that's how fractional reserve banking works. The problem with that is you've got this inherent problem of confidence that if if all the depositors like me want their money back from the Bank of Conkers 3 at the same time, Bank of Conkers 3 collapses. And that's what a bank run is. And that's that's why we have, have these issues. Um, the other interesting thing is that tonight, uh, you know, we're recording this. What, what did we say? It was 22nd of March 2023. Um, at six o'clock tonight, we started recording at about 6.15. At six o'clock tonight, the Federal Reserve came out and said they were raising interest rates by 0.25% of a, a point. 
Um, and then tomorrow at midday, we've got the Bank of England rate decision. Um, but the interesting thing is that there's a feeling that because of the bank crisis, it's actually going to hold the central banks back from raising rates too much too soon. So if anything, it's sort of tempered interest rate expectations. So it's it's such a complicated puzzle, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, personally, I think because of the inflation numbers that we got today that were um, up again and took everyone by a little bit by surprise. I'm not sure why it took some people by surprise, but the computer, um, not computer the consumer price um, inflation index jumped to 7.4 for February. We're already in March. So the question is, is that the peak? Of course, we call in the 10. peak. 10.4, wasn't six, it? 10.4. 10.4. Yeah. 10 and it was expected to be 9.6. So it's yeah. a disappointing so, number. So, yeah. so, so it's a quite a big, big move up. And other people have called a top in the inflation figures in, in for this, for January, for December, for November. And here we are now, you know, in, in double digits at 10.4. Um, so we currently stand at 4%, the interest rates, right? Mm. Um, and I've got it here. Capital e economics people are, are the, one of the main predictors. And they're basically saying that we're probably going to still see a hike to 4.25 tomorrow as inflation concerns are paramount. But chief UK economist Paul Dale said the rate decision is still a very close call. But the CPR figures give the team a bit more confidence in their forecast. So it's going to be going to be a difficult one for them to to swerve tomorrow, Pete. I think if they do um, give it another increase to 4.25, and then when we get the March numbers this time next month um, in April, it might be a case of them going actually. March was the peak in the middle of the month, but we've actually rolled over. And we're now back down. Yeah. The March numbers is now below 10 or at 10. And we can see that decreasing, hopefully, because we've got all the winter fuel prices to go into all these calculations. So everyone's bill for Christmas having their eating on is still coming in for March. Yeah. So oh, they... forget about your tins of beans and your, you know, your cans of Coke and your potatoes and your tomatoes and all the rest of it prices going up um it is going to be the energy prices i think that really fuel it but today they were saying it was, ma it was mainly to do with food yeah you know, they food said it prices was, yeah food was up for something like 17 or 18 percent which is you know it goes back to the conversation that i was having with you last time about my lure yeah. pack or my, the wife's lure pack going oh, up. remember shocking <laughs> and mate i'll tell you what i i think there is potentially a bigger problem with food going forwards because there are so many things happening to the food supply industry that is actually restricting supply. And I just think it's it's a very messy situation. I mean, I, I was watching some stuff over the weekend about farmers and that, and they were all saying that, you know, they're not planting as much seeds and they're stuff. They're not doing it. They're, they're, they're well, basically ref refusing to grow produ produce well, they just or sell, even sell yeah. milk or even sell eggs or even do tom send tomatoes to certain places because, like, it's we're painful. not getting the price it's costing us. It's costing them a fortune to produce yeah. this stuff. Yeah. And and then you're going, okay, the cost all, all told is a pound for this for us. And uh, the wholesaler's going, well, I'm only taking it off you for 60 pence. Oh, yeah, yeah, and they're going, yeah. sod that, I'm not growing anymore then. Yeah, it's a big problem. You know, the cost of fertilizers is a big issue. It's gone up massively. And obviously the cost mm. of energy is, is a big factor with, with farming, particularly if you have like tomatoes that are grown indoors that need heat and stuff. So, you know, it's, it's, there's a potential problem coming down the line. And I, I sort of feel like politicians are just completely blind to this problem. And you just think, oh, it's, it's not clever. The other thing that, that apparently drove prices this month was beer prices and uh, alcohol prices going up so that's that's just down to you mate um but, <laughs> but um don't i, I, totally, lost, tum -tum. I totally lost my portrait no um, <laughs> you were saying uh, about beer prices going up pete as, yeah. a, as an issue as well no i think you know so, so yeah so the, the other thing that was i was going to say one of the big surprise i mean so much has happened since we recorded the last podcast the other big thing that happened that we've all forgotten about was the budget, yeah? And the, and apart from... Oh, yeah, I that budget. I don't think there's nothing in it. It was just, just sort of non-budget. He's held it back, mate. Yeah, Mr Jeremy has uh, yeah. held it back. Yeah. But, uh, he's going to be doing it nearer to the elections. You watch. He's going to come out with another budget later on. What? Um, but, yeah, and, and I think the mainstay of that was 
um, about um, what's it? The the pensions, you know, Lifetime unlimited, allowance. going unlimited, mate. Yeah. Oof, unlimited. Yeah. But there that, you go. anyway, the, the the thing that really stood out for me on the budget was two things. First one was the GDP growth forecast by the OBR were much better than they forecasted back in November. And that is yeah. a much more positive. I mean, they actually think that the UK won't go into recession. So for all of the predictions of recession, including me, including you, you know, we all got it wrong. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. And, go on. Question from the back here, from the dummies. Go on. How often has the OBR been correct, Pete? Never, never, zero, <laughs> <laughs> zero, mate, zero. So, so rest my case, mate. The oh, OBR, oh. great, great no, with numbers, not great with facts. No yeah. one's got oh, a clue. But a really interesting bit was that they're forecasting inflation at the end of this year to be down to two point nine percent. I think that's nonsense. I nonsense. Think, I think there's a lapping effect, so I think we get to a point where it drops out naturally anyway. But I think it's going to be incredibly hard to hit 2.9. Incredibly hard. Absolute nonsense, Pete. Yeah. Right. You think about the, the produce that you, your sta the staples that you go and buy, yeah. right? Yeah. Right? Your it's staples bad. that you go and it's buy bad. in the shop, in Aldi, in Tesco's, in Morrison's, in, in Sainsbro's, right? You're going in there, right? And you're telling me that by the end of this year, that product that's now £1.50, you're going to be able to pick up for £1.25. The, the supermarkets... No are really good it'll never drop the prices it'll never drop beat. they do not reduce the prices no no the, the, that's the point the prices won't fall but the rate of increase will be a lot less that's the theory i mean whether they achieve the, that i'll be amazed the, computer, the consumer price inflation index is measured by what we consume pete that's why i measure it right and when you think about the cost of living and people doing the shopping the shopping bills are going that way and that, so people putting less in their trolley, living on bread and butter, yeah. like, back, like we did back well, in the poor days. You know, mate. So, ah, uh, mate. The one, listen. The thing to look at is core inflation, because core inflation is energy and food, right? So that's really yeah. relevant to what you've just said. You look at core inflation, I think it actually went up last month, and it's something like 6.4 or something. So it's way above 2.9%. So how do they get that figure? God only knows. Listen, mate, if the OBR are right at the end of the year and we're at 2%, I'll give you what le little left hair I've got. I'll give it to you. How's that? <laughs> mate, That's I how can, confident I am. I can make a nice wig out of it. I can make a nice toupee. Or just, just make a little like Mohican, mate. A little tiny hey, little Mohican. That's what here's a question make. for you, this, though. You know, you know that Donald Ch Trump geezer, yeah? You know he's got, like, funny, weird hair going on? Yeah, yeah. When yeah. he gets put in prison, who's going to do his weird hair? I want to know. Rapsi Nesbitt will do his hair going back in the day. Remember Rapsi Helmet? With the Hamlet advert? Yeah. Rapsi Helmet. Rapsi Nesbitt will do it, mate. Oh, man. Yeah. I, I, don't even think he, that. I don't think he's going to jail, mate. He's, you know, Teflon Don doesn't do jail time. Right. <laughs> We've covered all those little bits of markets. Let me just have a break here, Pete, and yeah. go to, because we've had some really good news. Um, and thank you again for those that have actually subscribed on, on YouTube. Um, I can okay. say, this, I'm going onto the page for the Just Giving page, right? And mate, have you what, seen the market? I'm always saying to people, just bear with me, bear with me. Yeah, I'm always saying to people, please make a donation, please make a donation. We've had one of our better weeks, and I'm going to talk about why in a minute. What triggered some people to go and make a donation? And I'm not condoning this, people, but thank you ever so much for doing it. Was Pete's rather transient walk around the world conversation? about hippos stop it stop yeah, it people are only here for the hippos yeah. people are only here for pete's jokes <laughs> honestly you try and give some quality information about stocks the markets and it. let's just tell jokes about hippos mate, it worked thank mate, you ever so much for making your donations I'm, people i'm now thinking honestly. of a hippo a hippo with a trump wig there stop, you go. stop 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 don't it. go there don't oh, go there. so heart. folks We've made a, a miraculous jump over since the last podcast. We're sitting at £1,245. Thank you ever so Brilliant. much. Right, Brilliant. let's find some names here as to who's been generous and pushed that number over 1,000, because I was hoping to get to, hoping that we could get to 1,000. 
Um, let's see who's been kind enough to share some monies. Um, yep. Yeah. So we are, uh, yeah. And the first one was from uh, a chap by the name of Jeremy. 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 Um, Jeremy. And he said, worth it for the hippo story. Laugh out loud. Donated £10 plus £2 gift aid. Thank you ever so much for making that donation, Jeremy. We really, really, really appreciate it. Brilliant. Um, and then follow on. We have the quality small cap investor. I think it's his Twitter handle is a regular listener to the show. Yeah. Is at gone. growth underscore investor one. Um, so thank you. And thank you. he wrote, I'm only here for Pablo's hippos. <laughs> <sighs> So that was £30 plus £7.50 gift day. So thank you ever so much, Jason. Really appreciate that. And then we have Nigel the Green Yorkie. And he donated £10 and £2.50 gift aid. And his words were, I love spending time with you guys when I'm alone in the car. Ooh, that sounds oh, saucy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Nigel, thank you ever so much. Thanks for your podcast. They are great fun. And thought provoking too. We really appreciate your donation, Nigel. Really appreciate that chat. Thank Thanks, you very man. much. Now, um, a friend of mine that's on Twitter, Ali Shafra, and he Ali, yeah. donated a hundred pounds. So, Ali, thank you ever so much, sir. Really, really appreciate it. Yes, um, always enjoy listening to your podcasts and learning from others too. Well done for fundraising. Brilliant thing to do. Thank you ever so much. Now, this chap is just always 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 keeps surprising me with his generosity uh i've had a couple of conversations with him about stuff we're going to do possibly later in the year and he smashed it once again um and his name is elric yeah and I, his Twitter I handle the elric. Yeah. is the the lemming investor Thanks, and his mate. words simply are this is such an important cause guys and he's donated 200 pounds plus 50 pounds gift fantastic, aid so fantastic fantastic Thank you very much, Elric. Really appreciate that, sir. And then we've got an anonymous um, donator um, donation. Um, TPR 95 and 96, a couple of great podcasts. Good luck with the fundraising. Eight pounds plus two pounds gift aid. So thank you wow. to our anonymous donator and all those that have made donations so far. I really appreciate it. I understand that the cost of living crisis, food inflation, all the rest of it, is impacting some of your budgets. And I understand, you know, that some of you make donations to other charities, local and national. So any of you that can make a donation to this Memphis charity, um, we really, really, really appreciate it. And thank you to everyone that's done it so far. So we're sitting at 12.45. So our new target now is 1500, 1500. If we can do that, in the next um, two weeks would be absolutely fantastic. If you've never made a donation before and you can do so, please, if you can afford to do so, please make a donation. A fiver each would be fantastic. Tenor would be great. Anything you can afford would be brilliant. So thank you ever so much. Good stuff. Whether you are an experienced or new investor, you know how valuable it is to conduct portfolio enhancing analysis and to have easy access to data that will give you the edge. As a Twin Peaks investing podcast listener, you can access an exceptional offer via SharePad from ShareScope, the UK's number one investment data and analysis software for private investors and traders. This special Twin Peaks offer is available to new subscribers only, and you can subscribe using the promo code Twin Peaks. The incredible and exclusive offer means that monthly subscribers will get their second month free and annual subscribers will get their 13th month free. Sign up and subscribe to SharePad today using the Twin Peaks promo code and you can save up to £69. Visit sharescope.co.uk forward slash sharepad for further details and subscribe to the investing and trading analysis and data you need. Mate, um, I've got I've got a choice of two topics for you. Do you want to talk about, or do you want me to talk about, whatever? Do you want um stocks that fall in the market as opposed to stocks that are great for long term? 
quality and long-term returns? Or do you want to talk about different categories of environmental fund? I would prefer stocks going up and down. But before yeah. I do that, okay. Pete, I'm just quickly okay. sneak this in. Right. Yeah. Before you get yourself sorted for, for stocks that going up and down. I'm going to I'm going behind for those that are not watching now on YouTube, please switch over to YouTube now. Right. And if you haven't oh. subscribed, please do so while you're there. Right. I'm going Hello, to you just my switched over. Over. <laughs> Yeah. I'm going to move that out of the way so it doesn't fall over. But you will see I've just grabbed this book. This is the quality how to pick quality shares by our good friend Phil Oakley. Now, Excellent. our February winner of the Twin Peaks Challenge, as well as having the SharePad um, account availability and be able to use that for a month, he has chosen this as his first, well, sorry, the first winning prize. He wants this book and it will be going to him via Harriman House shortly. So that's the first winning book chosen. Oh, and yeah. I put a thread of all 15 books on Twitter. And Pete's going to retweet it going forward. Um, so you can see all 15 books that you as a winner, potential winner going forward, can choose from. And as I said before, the monthly prize, one book, the overall prize, all 15, and the runner-up of the overall prize gets five books. So you'll be able to get this and another 14 books, including The Skeptical Investor from our good friend, John Stepek. So, yeah. You'll be able to help yourself to lots and lots of different books, and I'll be put, sharing them up and down um, as we go forward. Pete, sorry, just throw that in there regarding Raj winning that prize. Mate, that's fantastic. Um, thinking about it, what I'll probably end up doing is talking about the envi environmental funds on a TikTok video that I'll create. That's what I'll probably do. Because if people don't if, know... If you, Pete, if you want to, we'll do that one next 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 podcast. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, but, go for it next podcast. Yeah, no, that's cool. Just in case people on or, who listen to podcasts don't know, I've actually got a TikTok... Well, I've got two TikTok channels. But if you just go to at Wheelie Dealer on TikTok, I'm pumping out probably three videos every week, which tend to be of an educational nature, or I do some that are more sort of timely and specific to the market, which are on a at Wheelie Dealer 2 TikTok account. So anyway, just throw that in. Right, yeah. Um, mate, it was it was an observation that I've had um, sort of recently around the markets and what I see happening, yeah? And one of the things that I know, I, I it's almost like there are two types of humans, right? There are humans that are absolutely fascinated and attracted to stocks that have tanked, right? So if you get a stock that's absolutely, you know, it's fallen, say, 15% in the least recent problem, yeah? That attracts people. If you get stocks that have profit warnings that, that tank 30%, whatever, that attracts people. Um, now, what, I mean, I think... As a short-term strategy, that's probably a, a potentially very good strategy, but your timing needs to be perfect. So, for mm -hmm. instance, the stock falls 30%. You know, you buy it at a good point as it's falling or, or once you think it's fallen the whole way and it's starting to turn up, whatever. You buy it. You can make a good quick turn, sell it, close out the gain, move on sort of thing. Um, but I'm not convinced that that's really a great strategy for choosing long term quality, consistent stocks, because I think what tends to happen is the long term quality stocks, when the markets are bad, the long term quality stocks might only get hit five, 10 percent, whereas a lot of this more more sort of troubled, more sort of junky stuff is getting eaten hit 15, 20, 25 percent. And, and it's funny how certain individuals are really sort of attracted to these big droppers. Um, for me, myself, I'm not actually that interested in big droppers because I'm more focused on the long term. I mean, I bought more on the beach, OTB, the other day. It hasn't dropped that much, but it has dropped with the pullback. 
But the point was, I already hold it. I wanted more of it. I wanted to average down on it. It's had really good results recently, and it looks damn good value. Um, so I was buying it as a long-term hold. I'm not buying it for a quick flip or anything. And I think if people are buying these big crashes, thinking they're good long-term ones, I think they might end up disappointed. Well, what, what's your sort of thinking on all that? I also see it a lot, Pete. And you, when you see um, some of the things that have happened with regarding certain stocks that have been absolutely spanked, um, we saw one today. Um, Impact got hit. Another one we talked about. I hold that. More profit. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. No, we no, see, no uh, it happens. Uh, yeah. we, we see the profit warnings coming, and invariably, if you see a, a, a double-digit one um, going down, 10, 15, 30 percent, invariably, you'll then see the people that you recognize, what you and I recognize as traders. Yeah. Talking about, I've taken a position, I've taken a slice, I've taken da, 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 because they're expecting it to go down and then bounce up a little bit. And, and sometimes that happens. Um, they get a, a quick 5% or 3%. But literally, this, this the, the scalping, the spread, <laughs> you know, uh, it could be 1% or 2 or 3% and they're in and they're out and they're in and they're out. I haven't got any time for that, Pete. No, I haven't I got any time I to do sure. that number of trades of a day for 1%, 2%, and 3%. For those that do it, and do it well kudos to you brilliant do you yeah. some trades and all the rest of it but the graveyard is full of full of day traders the graveyard is full of, of even more swing traders and to get it right on on what metrics are you using 30 second candles you know what charts are you using to be able to decide when the market's bottomed in a in an individual stock never mind in indices um so i do notice it i see it uh, it's very rare that i participate in it and then on the rare occasions that I do participate, and like I said, on, on Monday, I had an opportunity to buy a blue chip stock, um, which had been kicked because of the nothing to do with it. Um, and had the, if I had not been, you know, you know, a bit swayed by the noise, I would have gone in and, and taken that opportunity, not because that individual stock had had a profit warning, mm. but because the market was having the noise around it. So that's when I usually go in. But my ord ordinarily, Pete, I've done all my research, I've got my list of X number of stocks and I've got my buy zone for that particular stock. And then the market does what it does. Everyone's buying it at the placing. Everyone's buying it at the 52 week high. And I'll go, I like that. I'm going to buy it at this price. If it ever happens, yeah. I don't want the share price to fall for anybody else because they, other people hold it, but I've got my price that I'm thinking that'd be really good value. If I could get that price. And sometimes Pete, 80% of the stocks I put in, into that buy zone, they never come back. Mm. And I watched them and I watched them and I watched them and watched them. <laughs> and they just keep on going on. And I could have bought them here and they're now 50% higher, but I was too cheap because I'm greedy. I like a nice disc, yeah, like a big yeah. discount on what I buy, Pete. Right. I'm doing my summer parts analysis. I'm doing my intrinsic value and I want one pound of assets. I want to be UBS, mate. Right. I <laughs> want that discount. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go, look at me. I'm UBS. Come on. Give me that two quid of assets for 50p. That's what I want. But yeah, it doesn't happen sometimes, Pete. And you've and you got to go, fair play. For the guys and ladies that got in early, well done. You know, that's what we're meant to be doing. We're meant to be looking at value. We're meant to be doing research, looking for value. Don't overpay. We've seen so many different REITs, funds, all over the shop last year, 30%, 40%. I think one of them was over 50% 50, 50 premium to NAV. Yeah. Now you can't give yeah. away those NAVs. The, th the 30, 40 percent discount to now the same ones. And you're going, what's going on here? What's what's changed in the 12 months? Mm -hmm. You can't give some stuff away, Pete. So I'm looking, I'm looking at those. You spoke about my REITs and infrastructure and blah, blah, blah portfolio. Yeah. Just adding yeah. a few bits and pieces here, then everywhere. It, it can be done. But Pete, you're right. And to avoid the, 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 the crummy ones at the bottom end, because some of them will not bounce back. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so true, so true, mate. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk. Sorry, go, go on. on, go on. No, no, I've, I've got something else. But if you, if you, okay, oh, I was gonna talk about one stock. Um, for those, yeah, that you do that. Don't talk about get up early in the morning and don't see it. I put out on a daily basis. Um, from all the RNSs that go out, I'm just pulling out half a dozen or so, maybe eight or nine, depending on how much I can condense what they've actually done. The RNSs which I deem to be bullish rns's and obviously because i'm just i'm not going into i'm not pouring over the, the whole rns in great detail 
there's going to be occasions where what I deem it to be a bullish RNS turns out the market goes, eh, eh, we're not interested. Um, but ordinarily, I think it was, I think it was maybe Tuesday. I think I put eight out, and um, six of them were like plus five percent, plus seven percent, and eight percent, and so on and so forth. One of those um, companies, a tiddler, Pete, you can look this one up, is called um, MG Pharmaceutical, MGC Pharmaceuticals. And oh, essentially, yeah. they came out with some really, really good news. And basically, what they do is got, they announced that their uh, flagship product, Ar Artemic, a natural anti-inflammatory and nutritional supplement, had gained status over-the-counter product in the US, right? And the share price jumped 41%. And they reckon this is going to be transformational. And they also announced that they'd got a US-based distributor, AMC, had submitted a $2 million purchase order for Artemic. So they reckon that could revolutionize the balance sheet. And so that went up 41%. A tiny little, tiny little company. Um, but it's one that if you've got a tiny portion of your portfolio and you want to have a little speculative sort of run, and they can get something else going forward, some more orders going forward. It could be could be a, a, a big a big one to, to move, but high risk, tiny tiddler. So don't go bet it, bet in the house on it. What market cap is it, Pete? Just, can you see there? Yeah, it's um it, it's MXC is the yep. TIDM code. Um yeah, yeah. 15 million market cap today. Yeah, tiny, In, tiny. Interestingly, it jumped. Two days, well, you know, it jumped yesterday, yeah. Tuesday, yeah. But today it's down 12.5%. Yeah, and the that's really, the that's, that's, yeah. the really shocking that, thing is on a two year chart, it's basically horrible. just downhill all the way. I don't know if people yeah, can yeah, see yeah, that. Yeah, it's yeah. not really showing. Yeah, but. That's because somebody somebody decided that it was brilliant, you know, yeah. on, a, on, a year, on, on a two year, three year chart. It was brilliant. And it's only now just getting what it needs to get. But you've got to be careful with these little ones. I may Sorry, be ahead, wrong. Pete. I may be wrong, but I got a funny feeling there was a Russian connection with that one. There was something something I read about that one a while ago that I just put me right off. You know what I mean? I go, oh, I'm not. Right. I've not. Look, I've not looked into it. I just saw the. Well, I might be RNS. wrong. I might be wrong, and, but yeah. I remember yeah. sort of seeing that. But anyway. Yeah. But every every morning, around before eight o'clock, I'm trying to say, look, these look these res these results, this contract win looks bullish. There'll be a, a minimum of, of at least six. You can have a quick look at it, and if it's one of your stocks, great. If it's not a stock that you uh, that you know about, it might be worth a little research because some of these um, RNSs can be quite transformational in the morning, um, regardless of what's going on the macro level for certain little definitely, companies. Definitely, mate. Um, I saw a stock today that probably isn't something I would invest in myself, but I know a lot of people do, um, and this is M. MNG is the TIDM code, and it's what? Oh, have you got it? No, I'm just breathing because after la oh. after the last podcast, I was thinking, oh, he can't pick out one of my stocks again, oh. can he? Mate, no, 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 mate, no, 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 no. I might have one. No, no, I don't have MNG, I... and it's another one that Pete. It's on my watch list, by the way. Well, it, it's MNG, and it's a fund yeah. manager and a wealth manager. And it used yeah. to be part of Prudential PRU. It got span out recently ish. Yeah. Like I said, it's probably not something that I'd get particularly excited about because I always feel that wealth management and asset management is such a proxy for the market. And I sort of think, yes, well, are. I own I own loads of stocks, so what's the point? But anyway, so I hold I hold a couple of those wealth managers, Pete. And yeah. the reason I like them is because they are connected to the markets. When the markets recover, they recover. But most of them can afford because of what they do and the assets on the management can pay you a nice juicy dividend. Well, that's the and point. And you get paid the dividends once that's you the wait. Point. That's why yeah. I've got one. Well, M&G is on a forward dividend of 9%. It's on a forward PE of 12. But the really interesting bit is not only is there all that, there are also takeover rumours that Macquarie from Australia won it. But they've denied yeah. it, but there's yeah. no smoke the, without fire and it, all that. Over the next three years, there's going to be huge consolidation in that space yeah. because the, people are moving towards ETS, people are moving towards trackers, they're moving towards all these, and they're moving away from stock pickers' funds. Yeah. So they're going to have to just, not have to all merge, but there's going to be more consolidation going forward. 
And whether that's overseas predators or UK listed companies merging together, that's going to happen. And we've seen with regards to one of the companies that I own, Aberdeen, I still own that one. Um, what mm -hmm. they're doing is all of the smaller uh, funds that they've got, they're merging them together and or getting rid of or shutting some of them down to not have the having to deal with so many different issues uh, regarding certain funds. So yeah, it's a it's, it's a consult consolidating space, Pete. And M and G is a good company. I think an important point that's more of a general point here is that I would never invest in something just for the takeover. But if the company no 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 I, I wouldn't if I the company either. stacks up on its own even without a takeover. Yeah, yeah. And when it's you're bonus, talking yeah. about 9% dividend, then it's got to be interesting. Um, yeah. Then that makes it worthwhile having, and the takeover's a bonus if that happens. Absolutely agree. Or Absolutely sometimes agree. a pain in the backside if they do a take under. If they do a take under, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And what the, you know, we've talked about some of my takeovers in the past, Pete, but the, this is the problem, you know, and it's a good problem to have sometimes, but it's it's not it's not a nice problem in other times. When you've got a really, really good company in your portfolio and somebody comes and snatches it away, you've got to find another company of, of the same sort of quality. And that's not always possible. You know, so you're left with cash on your on your, on your your account looking for a home. Exactly. And you've got to find a subpar or a weaker sort of entity, maybe in the same space or in a completely different sector that you didn't really want to buy, you know, rather than having the cash on the balance sheet. So... You know, I prefer if most of my companies didn't get taken over. Now, now I've got one. St Sorry, I was just going to say very, very quickly. Earlier on, I noticed something had happened in the market while we're doing the podcast. Yeah, and right. the Nasdaq was up one point one percent, and I'm like, oh. wowzers! You know, that's why. You're I was tell me, it's, it's giving it all up now. You're going to tell me, right? It's giving it all up, and the reason is it's gone negative, and the reason is. Because obviously Jerome Powell, the the, the man who oh, runs the he Fed, he started talking. He started talking. He started talking because he always does his meeting oh. about half an hour beyond beat. So he's obviously let a cat out of the bag and caused a load of trouble. So there you go. But every not, time he starts talking after the market has, has moved up, yeah, it goes down. Yeah, he never says anything once the market's gone up. That oh. keeps the market up where it is, or keeps makes it go higher. It comes down again. Oh. Anyway, got... I'm going to throw one stock out there because I've not shared a stock for a little while. Yeah, that I think actually could do some good, and this will chime with you, Pete. I think, and I hope. Oh, I hope uh, I've got it. That's <laughs> a very political stock, Pete. Very political stock. This one. Oh yes, political. Yeah, um, and you it gov. is YouGov. It is YouGov. Whoa! Yeah, and it came out with Why its results you? yesterday, and the words that were used on the top of the RNS were strong H1 performance with continued momentum against a difficult macro environment. Strong significant margin improvement despite ongoing investment in technology and international reach. Continued confidence in achieving full year 23 market expectations. And they came out with revenue up 30%. Wow. Adjusted operating profit, 58%. Statutory operating profit, 89%. Adjusted profit before tax, 2%, 72%. Adjusted earnings per share to up 81% and statutory earnings per share up 158%. And I'm like, I read those numbers and I was thinking, uh, that can't be right. That can't be right. But they are correct, people. And they're utilizing technology even more so. And given our political environment and what may happen in the next general election, um, I think they could be very busy, Pete, <laughs> with stati statisticals and uh, analysis and well, presentations and blah 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 i think these that entity could do very well going forward and don't forget we've got the american um sideshow going on as well so i think they could be doing and making hay going forward um in 2023 and beyond um, i had those shares ages ago and um and sold them way way too early and kept them in my um watch list and never ever saw them again <laughs> back at the price i would have liked to have bought them at um and it's one i've missed um and am i an aggrieved um you know early seller yes mate on um sharepad now this is before the eight percent jump today so people need to factor that in um yeah so this was at a price of 9.95 so nine pounds 95 995p 
yeah, it yeah. was showing a forward PE of 27.5 and then a two-year forward PE of 23.8. So obviously those figures are slightly more expensive, but but with such strong results, those earnings forecasts that underpin those PEs are probably wrong and they're actually going to be a lot better, which means a true PE is lower. There's a little dividend, 0.8% next year and then 0.9%. The thing that really interests me about YouGov is they have got a massive amount of sort of hidden value in the panels of people that they use to do their um, polls and predictions, yeah? So what happens is a when, a, when a, an entity, a company or a political party or something wants to poll the public to find out what they So say, for instance, you wanted to ask, you wanted to ask the public, what is their view of the Twin Peaks podcast with that idiot wheelie dealer and that really top geezer conquers free? If they wanted to do that poll, they would they would go to YouGov and they would pay YouGov money. And YouGov mm. would have a panel of people who are invest, private investors. They would go to that panel and get them to to do votes on whether they thought it was a good, you know, a good podcast or not or whatever. And um, obviously, most would say it was dreadful. But anyway, that's not the point. But, <laughs> yes, but, that would but, be the issue for us both. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, but but these panels that they've built up are pretty much unreplicatable by anybody else. They've been building Absolutely. these for years, and there is so much hidden yeah. value in that. So yeah. when yeah, yeah. you see that you is on a really high PE. You've got to remember there's a lot more value there than, than, than you appreciate. And I, I think at some point they could get taken over because I think a bigger yeah. group would want that capability. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. That uh, level of um, intellectual property that's actually hi hidden and in, in, in intangible value that's hidden is unbelievable. Now, here's the best part of the of the story regarding you, Gov, Pete. I've just gone through my phone and dug it out, right? Because mm -hmm. I always keep a diary of... On my on, on Twitter regarding stocks that I, that I hold, right? Here we go. You ready for this? Yeah, go on. New holding, YouGov, sixty eight point five pence. Oh, right. Where is it today? Ten quid. Nine ninety five. Wait, ten quid. Yes, yeah, nine ninety five. It's over. October yeah, 995, the eighth, yeah. twenty thirteen. Pete, I bought that stock, right? And then it goes down. And I got shaken out of it. I trimmed some at 125 on uh, the 7th of April, um, 2014. Then I sold the lot that was left at £2.51. And I celebrated making a 367% return. You not a 10 well. bagger, not a 12 bagger, you not a 15 well. bagger. I went, whoop, whoop, I've got 367%. And I've been waiting for it since then, Pete. Since December 2016, we've <laughs> been right. waiting for it to come back, and it's gone. Bye bye, conquers you loon loser. The train pulls away, and just carried on climbing. Wow, mate! So that would be going on near enough. That happened. Heading towards what would, it be, what would it be? 23 quid, wouldn't it? 23 quid thereabouts. Don't, mm. don't think about it. Yeah, don't, it'd be a, tw be a 20 bagger, mate. On the way to a 20 bagger. Don't think happens, about it, mate. mate. You're happens. Happens. You're I've learned a lot since 2013 and 16, to be fair. So no. we'll see. That's my last That's my last stop, Pete. Let me just see how long we've been running. Running for a little while here, mate. So we we'll need to call it a day. I want to guess. what are running 117. Stop? What do you want, want to add? What's your last parting words to these lovely people that keep coming back to watch us? Do you want to share a joke about hippos or something else to get mate, some people to donate some money? Come I on. Wanna, I wanna what's hit... your best joke of the day, Pete? Come on. I want to hit one of your stocks. That's the Don't link joke. it to Boris. Whatever you do, you'll upset some people. Mate, mate, I'm going to hit one of your stocks. I can, I'm convinced. No, you're not. I'm, you ain't going to hit yeah. one of my stocks. I'm convinced I've got one, right? I reckon S-U-P-R supermarket REIT. No, don't have it. Damn. No, Damn. I don't have it. I Listen, I've spoken to lots of people about it. They've got Man. the supermarkets. They've got them listed out. To various, you know, listed entities and all the rest of it. Super company. What's, um, what's happened to what's happened to the share price though, Pete? It just well, keeps drifting and drifting and drifting and drifting. We, um, it's it was, I think, if, if I'm correct, I think last year, 
where are we now? 23, maybe 21, 22 ish. It was at a premium, the NAV. I'm absolutely certain it was at a premium. Absolutely, it was. And yeah, and now you can't give it away. And if you think about companies that are going to go out of business, we talked about food prices. Are supermarkets such no. as Sainsbury's going to go out of business? No chance. No. no so what supermarket REIT doing going like that? Eh, 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 well, down. I don't. I don't understand it. Something I'm missing. You can. So maybe I should look at it closer and buy it. I don't know. You can pick it up at the moment yep. with a forward dividend of seven percent. I think that's what's the discount. Uh, what's the discount on the NAV, Pete? Well, you'd need to check the figures for definite. But it show. I yeah. mean, it's showing on Sharepad. This sounds a bit high to me, but it's showing on Sharepad as twenty five percent. That's a well, massive. That's not even the lowest ones out there, mate. To be fair, that's a massive. But yeah, that's a reasonable discount, discount mate. So you're getting one pound of assets for seventy five p, and it's yielding seven percent. Seven percent. I might have to warm my hands up, mate. It, I have it, to get the barrow out and go wallop, pop, you know bring what? up the truck. If I if I needed a reit in my income portfolio, which I don't because i got loads of darn things, that's one I'd <laughs> definitely be looking at. Definitely would be. Yeah. But hey. There we go. Can't own everything, mate. Can't have everything. We can't buy all the stocks that are in the market. But boy, oh boy, I've got so much cash sitting on the balance sheet at the minute. I'm going rubbing my hands together. If, if we get to Thursday, Friday, Pete, and there's no other, you know, we do talk about First Republic Bank, F ticker symbol, FRC. Oh. God. That's the worry in, in the US. We want that one to be resolved. It keeps going up 30, 40, 50 percent up and down like a yo yo, you know. Um, and we want that to get resolved. And if that stops the contagion in America, hopefully, hopefully, I'll be back buying far more going forward. What are you laughing at? I'm laughing my head off because real time update during the wheelie, de wheelie dealer oh, conference three, twin people. How far down have we gone? Mate, Nasdaq is up now, 0.5 percent. It's completely mad. You can't, you cannot, you can't make it up. You cannot make. There's this trader's paradise. There's too many people with a supercomputer in their in their pockets going, yeah. bye, 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 sell, 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 boo, 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 boo. Oh, it's madness. You should be able to throw around a market of that size by one percent and half a percent, one and a half percent, two and a half percent in the space of 20 minutes, half an yeah. hour. You shouldn't be able to do that, Pete. You know what algorithms and and machine learning and AI crunching all the all the numbers it's ridiculous you know what happened mate jerome powell was doing his speech and he probably like scratched his ear and it's like oh my god he scratched his ear sell 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 you know that's a clue that's a clue yeah. or maybe it was just jermaine powell stopped talking and the market went right time to buy again <laughs> oh my gosh right <laughs> folks we've given we've had a bit of a marathon here pete yeah, and, we, and we've just about finished. We've going we on almost a bit. finished around the same time as we started the last one. Yeah, isn't that weird? That's <laughs> true. And and your pile of books stayed up, still there. Oh, one, this, I think this is what, one's gone do, flat. Do, 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 this is the book. I will dedicate this book to Jermaine Powell. Right? Yeah. This is a this is a massive, 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 massive book, and it's worth reading. The extraordinary. Sorry, the extraordinary popular delusions and madness of crowds. Brilliant book. Charles McKay. Brilliant. Big book. Yeah. Big book. Well worth a read. If you can get hold of this copy or this book, do so. I've because got... it'll just train you not to follow the crowds. Don't listen to the noise. Don't be coerced into buying stocks that like everyone else got. The most money you'll ever make in the stock market is by choosing a stock or buying into a company which other people aren't talking about. The ones that everyone's talking about, they will go up. They will do okay for a while. But the ones that will outperform them are the ones no one's talking about. Mate, I've got that book, and I don't know why, but my version's tiny. Maybe it's got like half the pages missing. This book? Yeah, I've got it, but it's like, I'll get it for the next podcast, I'll dig it out, and I'll have it on the screen. It is tiny. I don't understand it, mate. Brilliant book, though. I love it. It's got all the stuff about tulip mania and stuff, which is worth reading because it's hilarious. And it happened. Right. We're still talking. Pete, let's call this one, mate. Come on. Yeah. Let's end it. Yeah. Ladies and gents, hopefully in the next podcast, which will be the end, we've already ended March, we will be talking about 
the March winner for the Twin Peaks Challenge. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, we'll hopefully have everything all sorted out for that. We're talking about the books that that person can win. We'll be talking about share pad that they can get get sorted out uh, with for a month, and and they'll be rolling towards the end of the year's competition. So keep going, people. Keep the faith. I hope you've had a good um, week, um, although I suspect some of you haven't, uh, and most of us haven't because of the markets. I hope it gets better as the week progresses, and I hope it gets better as the financial year finishes, because we're going to end up with the fin- end of the financial year as well as we end up in April by the time we speak to them, speak to you guys the next time. It will be the start of the ISA season. One parting word with regard to the ISA season, and I'll say this on Twitter as well, you don't have to lump your 20K or whatever it is that you've got in your ISA on day one, day two, or the first week of the ISA season. Have a little think, pause yourself, build your research now, build up all your watch list, and you can put it in, trickle trickle it in if you want to, if you can. If you can afford to put your money in all at once, and you've got 20K waiting to lump in, fine and fair enough, that's your call. Okay, enough of me rambling. Right, ladies and gents. That's the end of Twin Peaks Investing Podcast number 97, as we're near number 100. Thank you ever so much for listening to us. Sorry that we've not had any Ippo jokes this week, but please subscribe on <laughs> on YouTube and please make a donation if you can afford to. Pete will have a really good joke for you next week, next podcast, I promise you, right? No. Um, no. Take care. Look after yourselves. Be kind on Twitter as well as in face-to-face um, activities and show some kindness to some people out there that are really, really finding it difficult and the food inflation stuff is not helping. So show some kindness. And if you've got excess of anything and you know there's a little old deer around the corner that's struggling, go go and knock on the door and see if they need any help. You know, if you know any, I've not spoken for for about it for a little while, but if you've everywhere has got a food bank now and if you've got surplus and you've got a little bit that you can donate, or you, you're walking in, in in through Tesco, Zazda, Sainsbury's. They've got little banks of stuff where you can donate some tins or put some toilet roll or put some flour in. And it'll then go to the homeless and it'll go to food banks as well. Of it. So make a donation. Okay. Thank you very much. Take care, Thanks, people. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Be lucky. Stay healthy. Be kind. God bless. Goodbye for now. This Twin Peaks Investing Podcast is brought to you in association with SharePad from ShareScope, the UK's number one investment data and analysis software for private investors and traders. Visit sharescope.co.uk and discover the advantage.